that sitting like right in the middle of the other end? Yeah, we'll All right, Scott, uh, I'll introduce you. I'll let you introduce me and then we'll get a little bit. How's that sound? Sounds good. All right. Hello. Welcome to our presentation, Blood and Myth, the Mythologizing of Jack the River. Uh, I am working today with Professor Scott Reiner of Pierce College. He's an assistant professor of art with his BA and MA from Eastern Illinois University and his MFA from Ohio State University. He has focused throughout his uh, artistic career on memory and pop culture in reference to art and uh, film. He is also on the selection committee of the Preston Butte Film Festival and was the bass player for the short-lived but nonetheless important punk band Screw the Initiative. So Scott, I'll let you introduce me when we get started. Thank you for that introduction. And we've got Professor Heisel here as well, who many of you probably know. Um, background also, Eastern Illinois University for his bachelor's and master's in history, focusing on women and gender um, and uh, violence. And uh, I just wanted to thank Professor Heisel also for inviting me to be a part of this research and presentation. Uh, we've been great friends, for those of you that don't know, we've been great friends for a long time, both inside and outside of academia, as you can tell by the reference to our short-lived punk band. Um, and it isn't too often we get to come together and share our passions about our areas of study, especially as they happen to intersect. And this was a really great opportunity to finally do so. I have always admired Professor Heisel's academic rigor um, and his pursuit of truth and his love of knowledge. It's something I value greatly in our friendship and I respect it uh, admirably um, in his professional career. Uh, he's the real deal. Uh, and I extend my gratitude to him for asking me to be a part of this presentation. Well, thank you, Scott. We'll get started. I'll let you know when it's time to slide over your portion of the presentation. All right. So, Jack the Ripper is one of those figures who has transcended his historical place. He is someone who, in British newspapers since 1888, has been referenced 46,426 times directly by name. 888 of those are in the last 22 years. And when we think about that, it doesn't necessarily fit with the scope of the crimes that Jack the Ripper is credited with committing. In fact, there are other serial killers, for example, Elizabeth Bathory and Gil Murray, who were accused of killing far more. Uh, and I'm stressing the accused here because there's some question of whether or not they did this. Uh, Elizabeth was charged, has been charged with 600 deaths, Gil Murray as high as 800, I have heard at times, but neither of them really appear in the mythological lexicon the way that Jack the Ripper does. And today we're examining how that happened. And a lot of it deals with precursors to the event, so leading up to the killings. Uh, for example, you have the emergence of Gothic literature in the century leading up to Jack the Ripper, which deals a lot with uh, darker themes that literature had been dealing with prior to this. And in particular, Questions of morality in relation to science, and this will play in, I promise. Uh, notably, Frankenstein comes out early in that period. Uh, the Vampire by John Polidori comes out from that same weekend gathering with Mary Shelley. And then moving beyond that, uh, in 1827 and 1828, we get the Burke and Hare murders, which are body snatching murders for Dr. Knox in Edinburgh for dissection for medical students. And this creates a level of fear and distrust in the scientific community that will manifest again later. And 
This also plays in with the emergence of the story of Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, which plays with these kind of scientific fears as well. Uh, this is by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, he also writes the, um, the Body Snatcher. And what these demonstrate are split personalities. You have the respectable gentleman in Dr. Jekyll, who becomes an atavistic brute in Mr. Hyde. And the crimes that he commits in that Hyde persona are directly tied later to Jack Ripper himself. There's also an anti-vivisection movement that is present in Victorian society during this period. In particular, this is latched onto by feminist organizations because of women being struck down during childbirth and not allowed to move, and also forced hysterectomies that are performed on women during this time. And in fact, in 1887, there's a novel called St. Bernard's that plays out much like the Jack the Ripper killings. In fact, um, in a lot of ways, it feels like a prediction of what is to come in 1888. So we also get a number of penny dreadfuls during this period. These are easily accessible stories that deal with a lot of darker, murderous material. A good example of this would be Sweeney Todd. Uh, the story that he appears in is A String of Pearls. You guys may be more familiar with him from the Sondheim musical Sweeney Todd. And I would ask for a show of hands usually in the classroom, but I see some people nodding. They do remember Sweeney Todd. So these things are a part of the lexicon. They're a part of the culture. And there's also a very avid reform movement that's occurring during this time. Notably, uh, we have W.T. Stead writing The Maiden Tribute of Babylon, which is expressing sexual fears of the Victorian era, in particular in regards to young girls and women being purchased to sell their virginity in the prostitution rings of London at the time. So there's a real sense in London of sexual depravity and sexual crime that are becoming more and more prevalent, more and more uh, insidious as well. We also see the emergence of the new field of sexual psychology from Dr. Richard Kraft Ebbing, which brings an increased public discourse into sexual deviation. And the work of uh, people like Cesare Lombroso, who are beginning to create a pseudoscientific examination of the criminal race, as it were. And this is something that will pop up in the Ripper killings as well, this discussion of Jack the Ripper as someone who needs to be studied for, for knowledgeable reasons, to look at their skull and see what caused them to be this killer, not to look at the social or psychological causes, but physiological causes as well. So we begin to see this movement in terms of understanding crime as a scientific examination. On top of that, the British press itself is becoming much more literary in its approach. When you read stories during this period, they have literary prose and they are looking to create stories, not just in the form of a newspaper story, but more like a novel in the way that they read. This is all going to really push forward the idea of a mythologized Jack the Ripper very early on. So the Ripper murders themselves begin on August 31st with the murder of Holly Nichols. And one of the things that stands out and really pops up in the newspapers is that when she is discovered, her head has almost been severed by having her throat slit. But there's no blood. And this is reported widely in the newspaper that there is no blood. And at first they think that this is because she was moved to her location, but then they note that there is no damage to her clothing and there is no blood on her clothing despite being disembodied. They later find blood had pooled in her soft tissues, but the reality is, is that scientific explanation is much less important to the public than the fact that there was no blood. And people start to reference mythological aspects, such as the vampire. And it also resonates uh, in the September 5th edition of the Daily News. You have 
a report about people on the street corners talking about the murder, and one man references Lady Macbeth from uh, childhood viewing of the play, in which, in the scene in which she's saying, out, damn spot, out, where she's trying to wash her hands of the blood, the metaphorical blood of the murders, and she can't get it off, and he takes that as literal, and he views blood as being very hard to wash off, so the fact that there is no blood, that it could not have been cleaned in their mindset, gives the Ripper an almost metaphysical character to himself. On September the 10th, we have the second killing of Annie Chapman, and she's disemboweled again. And this brings up those fears of vivisection that were discussed earlier, that the uh, feminist movement had been uh, driven by in a lot of cases. And with this vivisection, with this murder, we also have a time period in which someone leaves the house that she's discovered in at 5.20 in the morning, and there is nothing there. But then later at 550, when another lodger leaves the building, her mutilated corpse is discovered, which gives us a 30 minute window for the murder to have occurred in that span in broad daylight as well. And again, the killer would have been covered in blood, but no one notices this. And this gets a lot of play in the press. The Daily News again states uh, just after this, the wildest imagination has never combined in fiction so many daring improbabilities as have here been accomplished in fact. And the killer is said to have a tigerish passion for blood. This is already creating a mythology. You have someone who is creating mass hysteria by committing crimes, but the evidence and the way they are discovered is almost unimaginable to people. And as the newspapers already noted, that they're almost fictional in nature. It does not feel like a crime that would normally be committed. On top of this, we have theories beginning to emerge that play on past uh, prejudices or sympathies. Originally, we have the uh, idea of leather apron, that you have someone that's working in the meatpacking industry that's wearing a leather apron that's committing these murders. They wouldn't be noticed because they're already covered in blood from slaughterhouses. But these people that are being described as leather apron are almost always Jewish in description. And it's playing into long-held anti-Semitic tropes that exist within English society. And even kind of references back to the libels of ritual murder from the Middle Ages, where you would have Jewish communities accused of stealing children and murdering them, murdering them in ritualistic fashion and leaving the bodies to be discovered. So not only is it playing off of modern, excuse me, in the sense of this event, modern issues that are coming to the forefront, but it's also hearkening back to older held prejudices and mindsets. Now, one of the other elements that we really look at this is that the, mon the uh, killer is being referred to as a monster fairly early on. And this is something that we can take with a grain of salt in a lot of cases because killers are often referred to as monsters. But by mid-September, the London papers are openly calling for the British government to offer a reward. And they are also beginning to attribute past murders to the river as well. So you have this idea that only the government getting directly involved can stop these murders. And at this point, there have only been two murders. And they are beginning to look at past murders and attribute them to the Ripper because they need someone to be guilty of these that has a manifestation in a name. In that case, this would be Jeff. So one of the things that does start to pop up in the newspapers during this time is journalists begin to create kind of travel journals of going to Whitechapel, going around the neighborhood. And when you read this, they read like colonial fiction. They're going to a strange and exotic land. They are engaging with people whose customs are not their own. And this is playing into the mythology of the empire that exists already. So the language being used in these newspapers is hearkening to linguistic cues that a lot of the readers would have already been inundated with in their own fictional readings and their own interests. 
<clears throat> excuse me. Uh, on September 27th, the first river letter arrives to the Central News Agency. And that letter, <clears throat> excuse me, is it states that the author had to settle for using red ink instead of blood. And this has an interesting connotation to it. Blood is usually associated with things like witchcraft and contracts with the devil. And the Ripper letter using this directly is bringing in elements of the occult and spiritualism that are very prevalent in Victorian society, something that Victorians would very much latch onto and have attention to. He also promises one and promises to send an ear with the next murder. And in fact, the next murder is two murders. It's referred to as the double event, usually. Uh, it's the murder of um, Catherine Eddowes and Elizabeth Stride. And this is a police rendition of Catherine Eddowes when she is found. Papers start to expect the police to fail. They are really thinking that the Ripper himself has become someone who is impossible for the police to catch. This is from uh, the September 27th edition of Punch. And we can see that the police are considered to be blind in the case of the Ripper. And we actually have a number of atavistic Whitechapel individuals surrounding him, laughing at his inability to catch the Ripper. And these, in many ways, symbolize uh, people that the public thinks could be the Ripper. So we haven't yet seen the Ripper take on the more urbane image that we're used to. We're still playing on racial tropes and atavistic ideas of a degenerate. But one thing that does come out of this is that the papers begin to view the Ripper as a brilliant individual, someone who has outsmarted the police, not committed crimes the police can't solve, but outsmarted them. Uh, the Daily News on October the 1st states, he selected his spot with a cunning and acuteness that are in themselves among the most bewildering features of these mysterious crimes. They believe that the Ripper is choosing locations to taunt the police. And as we move on, we begin to see the formation of vigilance committees. These are local groups of people who are trying to capture Jack the Ripper. And when we look at this image, there's something that is quite striking about it. The vigilance committee here is clearly made up of Sherlock Holmes and Dr. Watson. Holmes has not been tied to these cases at this point, and he is a major literary figure that is viewed as the epitome of crime fighting in the British mindset. So the idea that the Vigilance Committee is made up of someone like Sherlock Holmes with his faithful companion, Dr. Watson, adds to the mythological component that is appearing within the press from these murders. In fact, this is from the October uh, 13th edition of the Illustrated London News. We begin to see amateur detectives flooding Whitechapel. Uh, in one case, the president of the Bank of London is said to be in disguise, roaming Whitechapel looking for the killer. This idea that they have to do something because the police are clearly incapable. On October the 2nd, the Daily Telegraph states, no one possesses the least belonging or even the faintest material evidence that exists in the flesh at all. This is creating a spectral image around the river at this point. They know that the Ripper exists and that he's killing people, but they don't have physical evidence that he exists physically. So this is something that will manifest itself again. We also have other elements of spiritualism. A woman claims that the still unidentified Elizabeth Stride is actually her sister, and that she was spiritually visited by her sister on the night of the killing and kissed three times on the cheek, which caused her to wake up. And one reporter from the Daily Telegraph, fairly shortly after this, is taking this report from this woman as fact, not just a report from a woman, which a lot of newspapers treated it as, but as a factual, spiritual intervention in the Ripper killings. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, in this case, we see the nemesis of neglect, which I know that Scott will talk about later. 
But this is one of the first manifestations of a spiritual river who is an embodiment of the neglect that the British press feels the British government has visited upon the citizens of Whitechapel, upon the slums of the city, and that the government has not done enough to help these people. And we can see it here that it is in fact this spirit of neglect that is the river, not necessarily a person or individual. We also get a pen, pen and dreadful around this time called the Curse of Meyer Square, which is a direct examination of the murder of Catherine Eddowes. And it's the first example of the river appearing in fiction while the river's killings are happening. Newspapers are beginning to openly compare him to Jekyll and Hyde. In fact, the uh, Pall Mall Gazette goes through a list of theories regarding the river. One of them quite openly states the Jekyll and Hyde theory. This idea of a split personality that is manifesting within a gentleman who is then becoming an atavistic group who's going out and killing. And the star actually calls for military intervention. I think that the military should be called in to stop Jack the River, the serial killer. Something that the modern mindset would find to be ludicrous in its scope. Uh, at this point, any horrific crime that is committed Really. Thank you. Uh, any horrific crime begins to be attributed to the river. We have body parts that are appearing in the Tem Thames Embankment region, and these stories had started off as individual stories themselves, but by the time the leg is found, uh, first it's a torso, then it's an arm, then it's a leg, they never find the head. But by the time the leg is found, they start to associate it with the Whitechapel killings, and actually speculate that it is, in fact, Jack the Ripper, who has killed someone else, whose body parts are now starting to appear in uh, the embankment area. We even get one letter to the uh, Daily Telegraph on October 3rd that says that the victim locations begin to form a dagger when you look at them. And when we include the killing of Martha Tabor, who was killed before these killings started, and the last killing of Mary Jane Kelly, we can see what this individual was discussing. Other people start to associate this with a pentagram, but the reality is they're looking for patterns. They see these examples. And in this case, the dagger is pretty easy to see, right? Like you have the hilt that goes out and then the blade coming down into the handle. But it's almost mythological in the way that it's discussed. Now, on October the 16th, we have a letter to the Whitechapel Vigilance Committee that comes with a partial human kidney, and it alludes to cannibalism. The killer says that he ate the other half of the kidney and that it was very nice. But it's also addressed from how, which is creating a kind of occult power to the Ripper himself. And it's the letters and their taunting nature that has kind of captured public opinion at this point. Uh, I am going to warn you that the next slide is quite gruesome. Um, November the 9th, we have the murder of Mary Jane Kelly. It is the only one that's committed in a room. And we can see that the scope of the killing has gone well beyond past murders. And the description of this killing is completely horrifying to the public, as it should be. But the level of brutality that is meted out upon her creates a sympathy for Mary Jane Kelly. And afterwards, she is portrayed in a much more positive light. The newspapers look to romanticize her life. And one of the things that we really begin to see here is that the newspapers in general are calling this murders of a gothic sex, sex beast. They are creating this tie between literature and reality. And we begin to see it pop up in popular culture as well. Little boys to scare girls start playing games they call Ripper, where they claim to be the Ripper and chase little girls. Men accused of domestic violence use language such as they will white chapel their wives. And we begin to see family myths emerge where respectable women 
go out and they are going out to do the shopping and they are accosted by someone who interrogates them about their lives. And once he determines that they are in fact respectable, lets them go. And then the body of one of the murdered prostitutes is found a few blocks away later. So we have in the mindset of the public, this kind of mythological protection. In fact, one female reporter at the time states that the Ripper respects and protects respectable females. A ludicrous statement on its face, but it's showing a level of understanding of the killer's motives and targets, but at the same time, trying to assuage the beliefs uh, or the fears, I should say, of middle-class and upper-class women of London. We also see uh, horror figures begin to really attach to Jack the Ripper. Uh, 1898, Bram Stoker releases Dracula. And there are elements of this killing of, of Dracula that we can see in the Ripper. This description of him being kind of uh, atavistic with the fur in his hands goes back to the atavistic elements of um, the early theories about Jack the Ripper. And in the 1901 Icelandic edition of Jack of Dracula, excuse me, Bram Stoker himself ties the 1888 killings of Jack the Ripper to his own work and his own book, showing that there is definitely an influence here. And even in my discussions with uh, Moore Castle, who is the author of the Writer's Digest annotated classics version of Dracula, who went through Stoker's notes, says that while there is no direct reference to the Ripper, the way that Stoker approached the novel and how he interacted with the society that he lived in shows that he would have very much been aware of these things and very much influenced by them. So at this point, I'm actually going to turn the presentation over to Scott so that he can start to uh, deal with a little bit later all of these things. Thank you. So... I think that that's a great setup. There's a lot of really great stuff that we will see sort of shades of those comments and echoes of these stories that had already uh, started and been and been worked on and been developing. Um, we'll see them occur all throughout history, all the way through to contemporary pop culture. So uh, his name appears in over a hundred books, films, television shows, um, despite the fact that the murders he committed and the subsequent investigations remain relatively unclear, right? Today, he could be thought of really, I think, as two separate entities. We've got Jack the Ripper of the real world, and we've got Jack the Ripper, the sensational legend. Uh, since little is known about the former, even to this day, we must analyze the latter in order to really understand what this fascination is with such a character. Uh, Jack the Ripper, arguably, but we kind of have collectively decided, only killed five women in London in 1888. And yet his name conjures to this day an image of an immortal villain uh, in a timeless tale of sensationalized murder. In 1913, we have the first novel-length fiction book about Jack the Ripper uh, published called The Lodger by Marie Bellick Lowndes. Uh, significant because it would later on become the premise for the first silver screen adaptation by Alfred Hitchcock in 1927. Um, the film portrays the, the murdered women as being young, blonde showgirls, and the killer as an Americanized version of Jack the Ripper, who they refer to as the Avenger. And this is in The Lodger, A Story of London Fog. Uh, throughout the 1920s and the 1930s, he was depicted in film as dressed in everyday clothes. Uh, we can kind of describe him as a man with a hidden secret. And again, you see that reference to the sort of uh, Jekyll and Hyde aspect, preying on his unsuspecting victims. Uh, for example, in 1926, Leonard Mathis, or Len, Leonard, Leonard Matters, sorry, proposed in a magazine article that the Ripper was an eminent doctor. And this is a, a theory that will then continue to uh, be, be all throughout all kinds of different media. And he's given the pseudonym Dr. Stanley. He committed the murders in revenge and fled to Argentina. And his, uh, he expanded on his ideas later on into a much larger book called The Mystery of Jack the Ripper in 1929. Uh, this book was marketed as a serious study, but we know that it contains obvious factual errors and the documents that it supposedly references in its, in its creation have actually never been found. 
This theory presents itself, as I said, throughout multiple places in popular culture. Uh, for example, an episode of The Veil, a 1958 television series. Uh, there's an episode called Jack the Ripper in which a clairvoyant um, identifies the Ripper as a respectable surgeon whose death has been faked in order to cover his incarceration in a lunatic asylum. Uh, in 1959, there's a film called Jack the Ripper, also based on this theory. And by the 1960s, uh, he had really become the symbol of a predatory aristocracy. Uh, this, this is uh, from Clive Bloom and his Jack the Ripper, A Legacy of Pictures. Uh, and he was more often by now portrayed as wearing a top hat, dressed as a gentleman, um, and by this point in time, the establishment as a whole had really become uh, the villain, and Jack the Ripper became a manifestation of upper class exploitation. Uh, it's likely even that this is how you personify the look of Jack the Ripper in, in an image like this. Um, and that continues, obviously, all the way to today. Of course, then beyond that, we can examine how absurd things begin uh, to, 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 to be as we traverse the history of his depictions um, and the various fantastical creations. Um, and so we're gonna just go through some of the brief, uh, not so brief history of how these manifestations have occurred in popular culture. In 1969, we've got uh, a film called Night After Night After Night, which is a low budget production that casts a high court judge played by Jack May as a demented copycat ripper who attacks prostitutes in London, Soho. 1965, A Study in Terror, and 1979's Murder by Decree refer back to this image that Professor Heisel had shared. Uh, and these are the productions in which Sherlock Holmes is now pitted against the Ripper. So we've, we see that, that being identified, that theme being sort of brought back into uh, the, the small screen. Throughout the 1970s and 1980s, films uh, are then created which have very weak links to the true story, um, really kind of believed to only be introduced for introducing that character into their stories for commercial reasons only. Um, we've got a whole range of things that occur in this time period. So we've got things like Jack the Mangler of London, 1973, uh, What the Swedish Butler Saw, um, 1975, uh, and many other sort of, of these strange, I would say, sexploitation horror films, Blade of the Ripper, 1970, um, The Ripper of Notre Dame, 1981, The New York Ripper, 1982. Uh, and again, what I find particularly interesting about these films in these early sort of pop culture references is just their change in location, right? So we've got, we've got a, a very simple change of location, which gives us one other reason to consider how big and how expansive this myth of Jack the Ripper is becoming. <clears throat> Excuse me, next slide, please. So here we've got, uh, again, now we've got these different topics that appear. So 1973, Jack the, Jack the Mangler of London, um, AKA the Seven Murders for Scotland Yard. We've got the theme of cannibalism from the previous letters appearing in this film. 1975, we've got what the Swedish butler saw, which is this weird kind of strange sex comedy um, again, loose connections even to Jack the Ripper as, as a character, really just to sell the idea of that. Um, 1984, Fear City, uh, Jack the Ripper copycat killers uh, targeting strippers. 1986, uh, Night Ripper, which is updating the legend of Jack the Ripper into this sort of typical 1980s neon-soaked haze. Uh, 1988, Jack's Back, which is a serial killer in Los Angeles now, celebrating Jack the Ripper's birthday by uh, participating in his own killing spree. Uh, and 1989, we've got Japanese Assault, Jack the Ripper, and Edge of Sanity, which continue this kind of cocaine-fueled Jack Hyde, uh, Dr. Jekyll, Mr. Hyde kind of narrative. From there, we embark on the time-traveling Jack the Ripper. Uh, in 1979, we've got a film called Time After Time, in which Jack escapes in a time machine to modern-day San Francisco and is pursued by none other than H.G. Wells himself. And in 1979, again, a strange film, very strange film called Bridge Across Time, also known as Terror at the London Bridge, also known as the Arizona Ripper, in which Jack the Ripper's spirit is transported to Arizona in a cursed stone from the London Bridge, only to reemerge and wreak, wreak havoc on Arizona, right? So we've got now this, this introduction of this strange time traveling Jack the Ripper into this mythology. From there, we can travel that and continue that narrative into the fantastical beings, the various fantastical beings and strange events of television. 
1943, Robert Block's short story, Yours Truly, Jack the Ripper, uh, published in Weird Tales, in, uh, casts Jack the Ripper as an eternal who must make human sacrifices in order to extend his immortality. So here we see an image of that. Next. Uh, that leads directly here to a uh, Star Trek episode, Wolf in the Fold, uh, directly referencing uh, that sort of narrative uh, in that previous uh, short story, in which uh, Jack the Ripper turns out to be a long-lived non-corporeal being that has committed mass murders on many worlds over many centuries in order to generate fear. So again, we've got that reference to the sort of fear-mongering of that story. Um, the emotion on which it, it feeds as an entity and this ends with the entity being beamed back out into space. Continuing television, we've got Cimarron Strip, uh, a Western, and this episode is called Knife in the Darkness, where Jack meets his end at the hands of Native Americans. Um, and we've got an episode of Get Smart called House of Max, where Jack the Ripper is an animated wax dummy. We have an episode of The Sixth Sense called With Affection, Jack the Ripper, in which a man is driven mad during a paranormal experiment in which he inhabits the body of Jack the Ripper. And we'll see that narrative come up again, this idea that, that Jack the Ripper's spirit can now inhabit other people's bodies and make them commit murders. We have Fantasy Island, an episode where a criminologist uses a time portal to confirm her suspicion that Jack the Ripper was in fact a doctor. So we see that reference again popping up. We've got an episode of Babylon 5 called Comes the Inquisitor featuring Jack the Ripper who was abducted by the alien Vorlons in 1988 and made into their Inquisitor so that he can then test beings um, who are being called to lead an important cause as they call it. And then we have a three episode arc of the more contemporary uh, series Grimm in which Jack the Ripper again becomes a spirit who originally manifested a century before the Whitechapel murders and has now re-emerged in contemporary times, uh, committing crimes all throughout history through this act of possession. And ending here on a particularly interesting and outlandish favorite of mine, a film called Amazon Women on the Moon, a 1987 comedy that speculates that Jack the Ripper was in fact the Loch Ness Monster in disguise. From there, we can see also that his name pops up and his entity pops up all throughout things like comic books. So we've got Fu Manchu, uh, a, a, an issue of Master of Kung Fu from 1933, in which the ancient megalomaniac known as Fu Manchu had this sort of intimate knowledge of Jack the Ripper or a successor of his, and may have even employed him as a successor and kind of made him do his bidding. Fu Manchu somehow imprinted the Ripper persona on his own daughter's lover, Philip, who later on becomes the Mad Slayer, another uh, sort of version of Jack the Ripper to continue throughout that, that comic book. We've got Gotham by Gaslight, which is a Batman comic. We can see clearly uh, Batman sort of as this, again, vigilante hero. So again, that, that idea of vigilanteism coming up as this, this solution to the Jack the Ripper narrative here as Batman. Um, we've got Doom Patrol. He appears in Doom Patrol, um, appearing in Amazonia, which is a Wonder Woman plot line, um, appearing in Judge Dredd in the arc called Night of the Ripper. And then, of course, that leads us to the masterwork from hell, referencing the title of that letter sent to the police by Alan Moore, which firmly roots its narrative in the notion that Whitechapel is uh, inscribed with paganism and magic, the city itself. So again, we see this reference to paganism and the occult. It relates to an obscure theory that again, by drawing lines on the map um, from the locations of the first four Jack the Ripper murders, they create satanic and profane religious symbols. Um, in this case, a pentagram. So again, we saw the reference to the dagger before, suggesting that they were predetermined locations for this kind of black magic occult ritual. Um, <clears throat> by committing the murders in this pattern of a pentacle uh, on the map of a city, he explains in the narrative that the murders act as a reinforcement of the pentacle's lines of power and the meaning that this pentacle of sun gods, obelisks, and rational male fire within unconsciousness, the moon and womanhood are chained. London becomes a textbook 
a literature of stone of place names and associations, quote, stretching far back to the Romans and their pagan gods. Bucks Row, the real location of the murder of Mary Ann Nichols, in pagan origin is the name for the deers that were sacrificed to the goddess Diana's altar. From Hell is illustrated intentionally in black and white, which emphasizes the shadows and darkness of Whitechapel. The buildings are indistinct scrawls of shadows, and Jack the Ripper, more often than not, appears as nothing more than a silhouette, forcing the reader to occupy the same murky and moral spiritual darkness that Jack the Ripper does. Artist Eddie Campbell's use of shade and shadow in his illustrations also contribute to the image of Whitechapel as hell, as this sort of subterranean and mythological place. Of course, this translates then into 2001's film adaptation of the graphic novel directed by the Hughes brothers and starring Johnny Depp. I personally think that from traveling through this history, we can really easily see how Jack the Ripper quickly, and in my interpretation, fascinatingly becomes the mythological time and genre jumping character who can now freely travel the multiverse and is not confined by the boundaries of space, time, or genre. I think it's really easy for us to see how this happens. It starts with the press, it starts with all of these preconceived ideas and notions about things that are already existing in society. It continues to develop in these sort of very extravagant, very mythologized ways all the way up until today. I think particularly for me, what's more interesting is not the, the how it happened, although it was extreme fun to research that. And I think it's great, a great uh, sort of academic study to see how this happens. But I also think it's interesting to examine this question of why. Why did this happen? Why does it happen that, that we can take a character um, and, and mythologize him so much to the point that he, he doesn't even faintly resemble the real version of Jack the Ripper um, that existed in time? I find two theories of this, or I've, I've connected two theories that, that I've had interest in to this, to this story. One comes from a, a pretty well-known uh, story or theory um, here in this in this book by Gerard Jones called Killing Monsters, Why Children Need Fantasy, Superheroes, and Make-Believe Violence. This book is often compared frequently to Bruno Bettelheim's The Uses of Enchantment, which is a very, very, very familiar um, uh, analysis, I guess, of texts throughout history that really expand on the myths surrounding fairy tales and their dark themes of, of violence and sort of explaining why those existed even in fairy tale nature. And it really maintains the belief that the sort of escapism expressed through fantasy, even if violent, um, is a means of releasing stress associated with normal life, especially in children. Um, so to take that theory or to take that belief and kind of expand on that, I think we can say that maybe there is potentially this element that we find fascinating about mythologizing characters that allows us to kind of replicate these inner thoughts or inner desires as a way of kind of manipulating our own destinies and manipulating our own ideas and our own projections about the world. Another, perhaps a more grounded, but also equally interesting way to think about this comes from uh, something like, like David Livingstone Smith's Making Monsters, The Uncanny Power of Dehumanization. Now, he doesn't directly reference the idea and the story of, of Jack the Ripper and the mythologizing of that. But in this text, uh, David Livingstone Smith offers a really poignant meditation on the philosophical and psychological roots of what we call dehumanization. So by drawing on, on harrowing accounts of things like lynchings, um, mass murders that have taken place throughout history, the Nazis. Uh, Smith really establishes what dehumanization is and what it isn't. And he says that when we dehumanize, dehumanize our enemy, we hold two incongruous beliefs at the same time. The first is that we believe our enemy is at once subhuman and fully human. And so to call someone a monster, what we are effectively doing is not merely resorting to a metaphor, but by dehumanizing them and calling them a monster, we really are creating this narrative in our mind that they are something other than human. 
So turning to an abundance of historical examples, Smith explores the relationship between dehumanization and racism, the psychology of hierarchy, which we can see present in the Jack, in the, Jack the Ripper story, uh, what it means to regard others as human beings and why dehumanizing often transforms them into something so terrifying that they must then be destroyed. And I think we see dehumanizing appear in multiple ways throughout this arc, throughout this historical narrative of Jack the Ripper. First of all, we see the dehumanizing of others. Um, as Professor Heisel indicated, there was a lot going on in society at the time that was already placing people of a certain status or people of a certain role as a lesser position in society, um, as this sort of predatory nature now for Jack the Ripper. So they've dehumanized um, these prostitutes and allowed these, these murders to then sort of take place almost in a, a justifiable way. We also see that what we have done is we've dehumanized Jack the Ripper himself. We've sort of taken these really gory and really real and really difficult to understand murders. And by dehumanizing him and turning him into this mythological creature, we've allowed these things to sort of take place and exist in a much more fantasy-based realm. And so I think it's really interesting to look at theories like this and, and see them as possible explanations for why something like this even takes place. And I, find, I found it really interesting to be able to uh, go through that history, um, the history side of things, as well as the pop culture side of things, which is much more where my wheelhouse is, and then connect them to these theories that kind of lend us a little bit of an explanation as to what may have been happening behind the scenes to give some sort of a narrative to or an explanation to um, the development and the mythologizing of Jack the Ripper. That's all I have to share. So I'll turn it back over to Professor Heisel uh, to wrap us out here. Much for coming. We are now going to open this up to questions. Do you guys have any questions for us in our chat? We have some people over in Westville as well. Yeah. Um, is it also possible another reason why this story has transcended time is almost because of its ambiguity, where there wasn't a person attached to it, where, as you indicated, even during the time, people were giving out fantastical theories that almost have ambiguity to it. So you can take it and either set it in historical fiction or set it in something as far flung as sci-fi. Yeah, I think that's a definite possibility as well. Um, in fact, I, I think that does play a huge role in it. Because if you actually catch the Ripper and you have someone that is the Ripper, all of these elements that had been mythologized become destructively human again. And we're forced to deal with the realities of a human being doing these things. So all of a sudden, this edifice that has begun to be created crumbles and you're just left with a man or a woman who did it. Scott, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I would echo that. I would say not only I, I think that's a not only is that a potential theory, I think that that's probably exactly what leads to what has happened with the mythologizing, because I think it, it is that mystery that allows these other things to take place. As Professor Heisel said, if we had an answer, there would be no need to mythologize. So the, the fact that the mystery was there to begin with and continues to this day allows these things to become bigger and grander and more extravagant than we could possibly even imagine because they all automatically exist outside of reality since there is no reality to ground that to. Other question? I believe there's, yep, yeah. in Wessel. Hi, uh, thank you both for the presentation. Um, I was really take, we joined a little bit late, so I'm sorry if you covered this already, but the I was really struck by what you were talking about, uh, Jim, in the beginning, and then Scott, the, dehumanizing of Ripper, but also of the female victims. And the images that you showed of the more um, recent um, television programs or films that sort of really, they show, they're, they're almost, you know, exploitive, pornographic image of women in a way that is sort of romantic, that kind of romanticization of, of the exploited, the sexy woman thing. And I and so it's here, it's like, instead of having sympathy with the victim or at least acknowledging the humanity of the victim, it seems as though it's, this is they're enjoying the violence 
given or perpetrated against women. And I was wondering if you could you talk a little bit about that, maybe? Uh, yeah, sure. So I'll start with the historical element and I'll pass to Scott. Uh, one of the things that we see in particularly in the newspapers is early on they're doing everything they can to let you know that these women are prostitutes without saying that they're prostitutes. They are talking about where they live, the intermittency of income. And um, in fact, Polly Nichols herself is said to have come to her lodging house, doesn't have the money to stay for the night, but says she'll be back in like five minutes with the money, indicating she's going out to do a job, right? And then once they start to use the euphemisms that we are used to associating with prostitution in Victorian uh, parlance, we get letters in that start to talk about how respectable women don't have to worry, that they, they, are, they are safe. And in fact, a lot of the newspapers actually start to lament that the victims don't have more romantic backstories, that they have these kind of tragic stories that they're used to from W.T. Stead's work with Maiden Tribune and things of that nature. Um, Scott, what would you like to add? Um, yeah, I would say that, you know, it's it's obvious, I think, the the problems that exist with those, with with that ideology, first of all. Um, but I think it's 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 very frequent that we see that popping up in in many areas of pop culture. Um, and I think the reference there, I, you know, I use that word sexploitation, that whole genre of of film and pulp and comics and, and things that exist around that, um, I think really is using those same kinds of fears, um, abuses. Um, allegations against women um, really as a way of selling, right? And that's, that's a, to connect that directly to that, we saw in those early media references from London that, that the idea was to sell more papers, right? And, 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 and in order to sell more papers, we have to reference the gore, we have to reference the, the phantasm, the specter, we have to reference um, later on, right? As, as it develops, we reference obviously the, the the sort of nature of the the fact that it's women being killed the same things being done in those in those sexploitation films and those those pulp comics of the era right it's it's all about how do we sell more of this film or sell more of this narrative um and so i think that there's a real clear connection um to like why that happened i think you're right in 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 the idea of exploring that as an element of dehumanizing i think is 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 really fascinating um, not in a good way, obviously, but it's really fascinating to think about like how strong that power of dehumanization can be narratively. Um, I don't know if I'm adding anything to your thoughts on that, but I think I think you're absolutely correct in identifying that there is a connection there. Yeah. So um, there's kind of what you said before, I'm sure there's a pattern that the victims are prostitutes when they're alluded to, but then one of the victims you said after she was murdered, then they, the papers alluded to her in a good light, trying to make her in a good light, romanticize her life. So why? What that really comes down to was her neighbors, in a lot of cases. Uh, Mary Kelly, Mary Jane Kelly's neighbors, in particular, were very fond of her. And whenever the newspapers would interview any of them, they would talk about how she had built relationships in the neighborhood. She had been a stabilizing force for a lot of people. And because of that, they saw elements of respectability that existed within Mary Jane Kelly that they could latch onto. And as I said, early on, the newspapers were lamenting the lack of romance to these women. And with Mary Jane Kelly, they, they get what they're looking for, sadly, right? And they latch onto that. You know? But doesn't that contradict the fact that, so saying that she has elements of respectability, so respectable women can be killed. So that doesn't assuage their fears. But she's still a prostitute. And that overrides all of her respectability. You can admire the aspects of it, but there's this idea of Victorian culture that the wages of sin are death. And by engaging in prostitution, she's still engaging in the wages of sin. She's reading that she's sin. Yes. Uh, so, um, actually, I have three questions. But I'll take them kind of one. So for you, Professor Heisel, uh, it, it strikes me that, um, as you point out, the disproportionately uh, uh, disproportionate interest in this case relative to the number of murders and the length of time goes on um, means that it's sort of a chord in a way in the moment 
that other things did not. And I wonder if part of this has to do with the audience that the dreadfuls and the newspapers were, were targeting. This is the same time as Herbert Spencer saying that poor people are poor because they deserve it. If they kill each other, that's probably a good thing. So, you know, why would they care if you weren't in that group that this is happening? So I'm wondering if you could talk about the newspapers and their, their various audiences and how that might have impacted uh, the reception and why it became popular. And then for uh, Scott, uh, I, I, I like this notion of um, the, the othering and that Edward Said sort of way of, of using um, Jack the Ripper across time to, to really characterize other people that you don't like. And so I'm, I'm, I'm wondering uh, how that reflects the moment in which it's happening. So like in you know Bond films, in the 60s, the Bond villains are always Russian because the Cold War. And then later it's a media mobile because media is bad, right? So it tends to reflect the times in which we're living. So how, how can we use Ripper narratives to say something about the times? And then at the same time, this, this worldly nature of this, uh, in this uh, Ripper is good to think on kind of idea. Uh, how does that also then reflect uh, the different cultures in which Ripper is discussed? Is it always a Western Ripper? Uh, you know, if, if, is there a difference between an American Ripper versus a Swedish Ripper versus a French Ripper? Uh, are they reflecting something that's more global than just a uh, constant across time and space? Okay. Scott, if you don't mind, I'll take the first question, toss to you, and then we can probably both try to tackle it. Right? right. So, with the first question, like which newspapers and how that's influencing it, um, the more reformist or liberal minded newspapers at the time, like the Telegraph and the Star, are definitely pushing um, this element of the Ripper to push reform movements, to push the idea that the government hasn't done enough to help the poor, to help the uh, disenfranchised. And W.T. Stead is a really good example of this because his main tribute of Babylon is one of the uh, hallmarks of that literary newspaper movement of reform. Whereas when you look at something like the Times, the, London, the Times London, they don't have any of the anti-police sentiment that the other reform-minded newspapers do. And they tend to downplay elements of the murders and to essentially say the police are doing everything they can. So what's interesting is that you have the Times, which is not engaging in this mythologizing, but the other papers out there that do have a wide reform readership amongst a lot of middle-class people are really focusing in on this. And because of this, we have this influx of medieval, not medieval, excuse me, my mind is somewhere else. The middle class private investigators and upper class private investigators flooding into Whitechapel, thinking that they can solve the ills of the poor, like they feel they can do it politically, but they also want to do it in this case, uh, in terms of detective work. Scott, do you want to take the next one? Yeah, I think, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure I understand exactly what the question is, but I think you're absolutely correct in, in that there is this, this idea that by becoming the other, um, it allows us to project all kinds of insecurities or fears that exist in reality. Um, in my research, I didn't really come across anything that was uh, distinctly what I would say like an Eastern perspective, um, which I, which I found kind of interesting and they may exist. I did, I did come across one, um, Japanese film. Uh, I, I referenced it in there. Uh, it was called, um, Assault. Um, but I didn't really come across too much from that perspective, but I do think the other has happened multiple times. There was that episode of Cimarron Strip, which is a Western, um, directly dealing with like the idea of Native Americans. Um, and I think like that, that again, is this one way in which the other is presented, right? We've got this battle between Jack the Ripper and, and the Native Americans. I think, um, you know, there's also like that idea, I think of the alien, right? The alien can be a substitute for many things. Um, that's a very common pop culture and, and sort of sociological response to use the alien as a scapegoat for anything that's not understandable or um, foreign. Um, we did have Fu Manchu um, in the comics, so I guess there is a, an Asian reference there, um, but I'm not sure that that had any, any kind of particular other reference. That was more, I think, about the, the spiritual and mythologized aspect of that. Um, 
Yeah. If I could follow up. Uh, what is yeah, what do you think about us in 21st century Northwest Indiana or uh, Puyallup, Washington, wherever you wish, that, that our version of the alien other is an upper class British gentleman? Yeah, well, I mean, I think I think that narrative is probably the narrative that never stopped. I mean, I think the idea of the upper the upper class British gentleman is one that is not uh, a creation of ours, um, but I think it is one that all throughout this narrative we've we've felt strongly about. It's one that we instantly recognize, um, and I think that probably has a lot to do with um, with class warfare, with with socioeconomics. Um, the, the idea that aristocracy, the idea that the, by putting him into this sort of position of power uh, in, a, in a society he represents money and class, it allows the sort of common folk to have this projected enemy. Um, and I think like that's something that still is extremely relevant in today's culture and extremely relevant in our narrative today that idea of like banding together to to find that common enemy and that common enemy becoming um, this bureaucratic individual, I think is extremely relevant in today's culture. I mean, even to bring this back to pop culture studies, which is an area of, uh, of mine, um, think about the fact, I'm not, I'm not sure if you're familiar with the film Parasite that won Best Picture a couple years ago. That's exactly what that narrative is as well. And I think we're seeing that narrative come up over and over and over again. Another really great film from this year um, called Triangle of Sadness um, tackles these similar issues. And we're seeing this narrative, I think, become even more prevalent in pop culture because of its relationship to society today. Oh. Your third question. Can we get you to repeat that real quick? Oh, you're fine. Oh, we're fine. Okay, yeah. um, jumping off of Dr. Lin's question, actually, specifically the Eastern versus Western idea, as mentioned, like basically all the examples are Western, and the theories of why this is transcendent, like the two on the screen, are based in Western ideas, it seems. So I wanted to ask why do you think it is? Not just because they were done in England, which is a Western country, but does it possibly have to do with like our ideas of horror, our ideas of what grotesque is, because I'm thinking of, for example, a lot of Western horror films is the slasher Friday the 13th, but in Eastern culture, I think of the grudge or audition, which are more psychological instead of slasher movies. Scott, do you want to start with this one? Yeah, yeah I mean, I, th I think you're absolutely right in the, in the difference between how those uh, horror genres have developed. Um, horror genres is actually something I'm, I'm extremely fascinating in and I've talked about many times from an academic perspective, but I think you're absolutely right. There's a very distinct difference. Um, I think that the, the particular emphasis on the Western narratives um, are, are because of their origin and creation. I think, I think it's easier for, for any Westernized audience to connect to a story that, uh, that is originating in that. However, I will say that I think the element that maybe does come a little bit more from Eastern mythology that we see popping up, although in a Westernized way, in a Westernized way, is the idea of the spiritual side of things. So we do see that that idea of possession. Um, we do see that idea of like a, 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 a non corporeal entity, this sort of thing that exists, this spirit orb that exists. I think those kind of concept, concepts do borrow a lot more from Eastern mythology than Western mythology. Um, so I think that, that that is probably one of those influences that starts to become a part of it. Um, and then, then of course it just becomes mixed and mingled throughout there. Um, but I think to, to, to sort of level that playing field, again, I would say that as we're getting to more closer things, and even things that don't directly relate to Jack the Ripper, but relate to this idea of dehumanization and, and, and things like that, we do see that there is now this narrative happening across, uh, I, I referenced Parasite earlier, that is a, a South Korean film. So, and it, and it takes a very, if you watch it, or if you're familiar with it, I think you would, you would find that it feels very connected to Western society, but that's because the same thing is happening right now in South Korean society. So I think it is, there is this leveling of that playing field happening right now so that it allows that narrative to become something that can maybe uh, 
be a little bit more expansive. All right, we have a question, what's up? Uh, yes, um, I have a, some very general questions. We missed the first 15 minutes because there was a breakdown in communications between them and Westville. So my questions are very general. First, how, well, actually, when listening to your talk, I could see that this is going to be a very fine monograph. That's going to be another brick in our construction of, of history. But the general questions are, how did you choose this issue, this topic? How did you know that it was going to be worth devoting a significant part of your life to it. And then how would you incorporate this into a Western Civ text? What would be the takeaway points for students who are not historians? Okay, so um, the, the first part of that, it's, it's actually kind of happenstance that I came across this. Um, well, I mean, to, came up with, with doing this for this presentation. Jack the Ripper's always been something that has been present throughout my interest in violence and, and uh, crime. So he's always been there. And I was reading the introduction of a book called Lustmark, which is dealing with sexual violence in Weimar, Germany. And in it, the author offhandedly says that Jack the Ripper is more myth than man at this point, and, and doesn't build on that at all. But the idea behind that really struck me. So when Dr. Connolly asked me to do a History of Madness presentation, I was thinking of that because I read it just like a couple of days before. And it seemed a very obvious thing to examine at this point because my interest had been piqued. Um, the second part, how would I kind of bring this in to Western Civ in a lot of ways is through examination of a few things. One, how we view class and class structure, how we view gender and women's place within that class structure and how their value is determined within the particularly Habermasian idea of like the public and private spheres, right? Because these women are engaged in the public sphere when they should be in the private sphere, they are paying penalty for that, as well as uh, building off of ideas of Victorian morality. And in terms of the mythologizing of it, it's this need for us to have a cause, have a reason, and without the physical manifestation of the Ripper, without knowing who this person is, because it could be a man, it could be a woman, it could be anybody, really. We need to create something to fill that void, and so that mythologizing takes that place. Scott, do you have anything to add? No, not particularly. Um, I was I I really just came on board because um you had asked me to, and I think that it's something that that connects in many ways to personal interests of mine as well as my my background in um film and art and and pop culture studies, and I I just. You know, I'd already done some research on this idea of um, mythologizing of things and why we do that. And and those two texts that I had referenced, Killing Monsters and Making Monsters, are both texts that I was already familiar with um, before embarking on this, uh, just out of necessity to sort of understand and fuel my own research academically and my own artistic practice. So I thought that that was kind of my entry point to saying, you know what, there is some truth to just that simple question of, or that simple kind of statement about the myth mythologizing of Jack the Ripper. Um, and then sort of to be able to, to trace that through history, um, I just found incredibly interesting. So I was just happy to be on board and happy to share my insights to that. Any other questions? Yeah. Okay, so presentation is about like how the story of Jack the Ripper was made, like, why and who? Are there like any details of the narrative that are like left out that you feel like could be included more often? Or... Honestly, um, in researching this, part of the problem was there, there was just so much that we could put. Um, like as I was going along for time purposes, I cut out uh, things that we talked about, Scott. You know, I'm sure you know. And uh, going through the newspapers, it almost became. Um, I'm trying to think of the right word for this, overwhelming the amount of newspaper requests that were coming out and how obsessively they were focusing on it. I mean, I had access to newspapers from all over the world regarding this, and I just focused on the British ones because that's really where the myth begins and, and moves out from it. And Scott, you, you were dealing with a lot of other elements, right? And I'm sure getting suggestions from me that weren't always helpful, but uh, do you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, I think 
Yeah, no, I would I would just echo that. I mean, I, my my research uh, as I was compiling things was much more expansive than than what I ended up paring down for this presentation. Um, there are there are, um, you know, I think I referenced quite a bit, and I referenced quite a bit of references pretty fast. But there are hundreds, uh, m multiple hundreds uh, of books, films, television shows, comic books, graphic novels um, that all reference Jack the Ripper, and I think. Um, to go through each one of those would be an extremely interesting um, and, and I'm sure a very insightful task to think about them as more than just being um, a pop culture document, but but in, in terms of servicing these theories and these ideas, um, that could be its own its own year's worth of study for sure. And there's definitely much more than what I I had referenced just in my in my presentation. Yeah, and one more thing to add too is that there, there are a number of other serial killers who take the Ripper moniker from the press later on that adds to this as well. And we didn't even get a chance to delve into like Yorkshire Ripper. Yeah, but yeah it's, they, it's, it's real quick, it's it's even been speculated. Um, I, I did not research the truthiness, the truthiness of this, but it's been <laughs> speculated that the um the idea of serial killers getting these kind of like iconic and easily recognizable names dates back to people like Jack the Ripper. I mean, you know, we, we can think about all of these serial killers that have existed throughout throughout history um, and they, they get these sort of specialized iconic names um, to trace that origin back to here. Uh, not to say it didn't exist before this, but I think that's a would be an accurate statement for sure. Any other questions? No? All right, I will ask uh, any of my students that are watching via Zoom to stay on for a moment so I can record you. But otherwise, thank you guys so much for showing up. Thank you for listening and thank you for your questions. We really appreciated it. And we hope that you enjoyed this and found value. Have a good day. Thank you very much. Thanks.